Welcome, everyone. It's so good to see you today. Welcome to our podregation joining us online. Yeah, you can clap for yourselves. That's good. <laughs> it's a good thing to be excited about being together in the house of the Lord, worshiping him and connecting with one another. And so if you are able, we invite you now, whether you're in this building or somewhere out there in the sphere, to stand with us and let's spend these next few minutes just focusing on our beautiful Jesus. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. Oh, good morning, Woodland Hills. So glad to worship with you all. You are my strength, strength like no other, strength like no other. Reach as to me. You are my strength, strength like no other, strength like no other, reaches to me. Sing it with us. You are my strength. You are my strength. of your grace. Sing it with us. In the fullness of your grace, in the power of your name, you lift me up. You lift me up. You lift me up. In the fullness of your
together as a body of believers to experience your presence to experience your presence whatever we have been going through father whatever the situation is in front of us we look to you as a source of our strength we trust in you and father those strongholds, those issues, those problems, those things that we feel like we can never get away from. We know, we believe, we stand in agreement that there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the precious name of Jesus. So Father, I pray that you allow that to be real with us on this morning. Allow us to have an experience with you where you become real. And the worst of this song becomes real in our lives. Yes. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Sing it with me. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power, there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, to break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain. All sufficient sacrifice, so freely given, such a price. But our redemption, heaven's gates swing wide. 
All sufficient sacrifice. All sufficient sacrifice. So freely given, such a price. But our redemption, heaven's case, swing wide. I wanted to become real to you on this morning. There is power in the name of Jesus. on in your life. The power is not in us, but it's in the name of Jesus. Jesus, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. Oh, there's an army rising up. To break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There's an army singing with them.
can be seated, but I just have to say, one of the reasons why I love worship so much is because it's a time when we come and we're singing our praises and we're exhorting this beautiful God that we serve, but in that moment, when we're praising him, he is setting us free. He is bringing healing and restoration to our lives. He is healing our hearts, and it's such a beautiful thing as we come to praise him, how much he showers his love upon us. And so thank you for being a part of that amazing, beautiful worship time. Thank you for tuning in online. We really feel the presence of everyone just coming together in unity to praise his beautiful holy name. All right, you guys. So you know that we have been in this The Lost Art of Friendship series. And along with this series, we've been doing a caption contest every week. And so we've had photos that you guys have submitted captions on. And so we had our final photo this past week and our final three winners. And so, without any more fanfare, uh, I want to announce our final third place winner. And that goes to, who does it go to? JR. And JR said, he's he's sniffing my back again, isn't he? (laughs) Thank you, JR. Second place goes to Edward, and Edward said, this is the reason for the invention of the unicycle. (laughs) And our final first place winner went to Kevin, who said, a picture of Greg steering a theological argument with Paul Eddy, and Paul says, I'm not sure about the direction this thing is headed. (laughs) Those are all so good. Yes, give our uh, caption 
contest winners a hand. And thank you all for playing along with us. It's been a lot of fun. Now, this coming week, we wanted to remind you all that we have two new Cultivate classes that are starting this week, and you still have time to sign up for those classes. The first one is our Spiritual Friendships class, and that's going to run for five weeks starting Monday at 7 p.m., and our second class starting this week is called Be Still and Know, and that is on Thursday nights for five weeks, also starting at 7 p.m., We are so blessed to have so many artistic folks in our community, and so we want to give you guys another opportunity to shine. We are um, inviting you all to submit something creative for our Grateful Heart Gratitude Journal. That's a submission in and of itself, your Grateful Heart Gratitude Journal. And so it could be a picture, a drawing, a photo, um, anything, but we would love to have you guys share what you are thankful for through an, a, a means of art, a short story, a poem, or anything like that. And those submissions are going to be due on October 31st. So we uh, invite you to get your creative juices flowing and send those in. And finally, we just want to let you know that we are always so glad when you're here. And if you are visiting and you want to say hello or ask any questions, we have a visitor area out in the gathering area. We would love for you to come on by and ask any questions and just let us know that you're here. Ultimately, we just want to let you all know that we are so thankful for you, that you've chosen to give of your time to be with us, and we appreciate it so very much. If you are a uh, part of the Padregation and you're visiting, you can fill out a visitor card online. How cool is that? All the things I've talked about can be found on our website, whchurch.org slash bulletin. We would love for you to find out all that you can about what's going on here to get more connected and more involved. All right, so we're going to close out this part of our worship service with the offering where we just offer back our resources, our finances to, to the Lord. If you do that at Woodland Hills, then you can do so now on the app or on the website. If you're in-house and you'd rather do that in person, you can do it to, um, through the boxes that are located on the back of the auditorium walls. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for how beautifully you show up for us. Lord, we thank you that you do break every chain, and we thank you that you do heal us. We thank you that you are our redeemer, and Lord, right now, we just want to offer all that we are to you, our our heart, our mind, our soul, our resources, our time. God, we just want to give it to you and lay it before you and ask you to touch it, ask you to anoint it, ask you to use it as you see fit to further your kingdom. We love you so much, and we thank you that you are so beautiful, and you are so good to us, and you are such a safe space for us. And we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning, Hills. Morning. Was that anointed worship or was that anointed worship? That, that was really anointed. I just it felt like, I, I, I love that. I love that. For, for a year, we, almost a year, we had, we were playing in an empty room. And it wasn't quite the it same. It wasn't quite the same. Uh, it's, 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 it's good to be together and to, and to worship together like that. So we're, uh, we've been in this series on friendship. We'll be starting a, a new series next week on, on spiritual disciplines. But we're here wrapping up this series that we've had on friendships. And uh, what we've seen, we've covered a lot of ground, but what we've seen is the bottom line is that we all need people in our lives that we've invited to help us walk out this walk. Uh, we need people who, who know us and uh, know when something's off and have the permission to speak into that. We need spiritual friendships. We need all kinds of friendships, but uh, spiritual friendships in particular. And that's something that we've really lost in this culture. Uh, friendships in this culture, it's kind of wonky. Uh, we, we don't talk about it much. It just sort of happens. It's sort of accidental. There's not much intentionality behind it, but, but uh, we've seen how important it is to be intentional about this kind of thing. Now, there's a number of people today who are beginning to call out just how, how dysfunctional 
uh, our, our culture is when it comes to friendships. Uh, we mentioned Wesley Hill a couple weeks ago. He wrote a book on spiritual friendships and he's trying to recover that. Another person who has been speaking out on this uh, is uh, Bronwyn Lee. And she, is, she wrote a book uh, called Moving Beyond Awkward, Awkward Side Hugs. <laughs> Move me on awkward high. Charades. I, 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 I've read this book, and it is really good. Um, you have a master of metaphors and, and uh, uh, some really good humor. Uh, one of my favorites was when you said that it, the, we have two words that we say to people about sexuality in our culture. It's either get married or danger, warning. Uh, be careful with this. And, and she says that's about as helpful as telling someone how to get from San Diego to New York by saying make sure you avoid the Grand Canyon. <laughs> Uh, it, it's masterful, masterful. So um, today we're going to have an interview with, with, with uh, Bronwyn um, on her book and topics related to that on friendships. And to, and to do that, we have my two esteemed colleagues, and, and they're Bronwyn specialists. They've studied her book, and so they're experts on, on Bronwyn's thought. And so we're just going to turn it over to them. It's Shauna Bourne, Emily Morrison. God bless you guys. Bronwyn, thank you. you know, this is one of the things that, it, it's been a sucky time for, every, for everybody in the last year and a half. Um, and this whole lockdown thing and all that. But some good things are happening as a result of that. One of them is that, I mean, we, this is the first time we have ever had this where we're actually going to interview someone over Zoom live. This is happening right here. She's in California, and this is, a, this is a first. Let's hope it works. God bless you, Bronwyn. Thanks so much for, for, for being here and being a part of this. Take it away, Shana. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Greg almost fell off the stage. It's fine. Bronwyn, it's fine. <laughs> this is what we do around here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, and we would love to know, just right out of the gate, Bronwyn, what inspired you to write this book? Because there's a lot of clever things, there's a lot of helpful things, and I, it's a very curious thing to know, like, why? Why did you write this book and feel like you needed to put it out there uh, at the time in which you did? I so appreciate that question. Good morning, everybody. Good to be with you uh, from several thousand miles away. Um, <clears throat> You'll hear right out the gate that I don't sound like you. Um, I'm South African of origin and I've been in the States for like 17 plus years now. Um, and that forms part of the story of how I ended up writing this book. Um, I have come to the States, lived most of my married life and most of my ministry away from my family of origin. And so the church really has been family to me in a really significant way. It's my church family that have seen our babies being born, that have walked us through all of these stages of marriage and immigration. Um, and from, so positively, I've really seen part of what um, the scripture talks about when they celebrate life as the family of God. Um, another part of my story is that I'm in pastoral ministry now, have always been involved as a volunteer as, at some point. Um, and just over the years, I've heard so many negative stories about people feeling that they don't belong or that they're excluded because they're uh, not married yet, or they're struggling with their sexuality, or they're divorced or widowed and feel like, oh my goodness, I'm not part of the married people's club, and so I don't have a place anymore, or just people feeling lonely in their relationships, like I'm not okay, I'm not sure if it's okay for me to attend this Bible study or for me to have this friendship, um, and just people feeling like they're lonely and limping in the church, um, that there's some script that they're supposed to be fulfilling, and they feel like they're not fulfilling it, and so they're not fully part of the church. And that breaks my heart. So both because I have experienced some of the goods of the church's family and because around us, so many of us are experiencing pain when we feel like we don't belong. Um, when an editor reached out and said, do you have any book ideas? I thought, I didn't think I had a book idea, but I actually have a lot to say about this subject. I care a great deal about communities being healthy and about church people loving one another well. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really love that you wrote this book because we talk a lot about the church as a family, like we are the family of God. And so it's helpful to kind of flesh that out. What does that really mean and look like? And Emily, you uh, used some of Bronwyn's stuff when you shared during the series as well. And that was really helpful. Yeah, absolutely, uh, because I am very passionate about church as family. I'm on a, I'm on a campaign to get us all on board. Uh, yeah, so, and in fact, uh, Bronwyn and I have a, have a mutual friend, Erin, um, and Erin was one of the first people who 
really showed me how friendship works as family. She and her husband, Brian, and their kids really included me in their family for many, many years. I still feel family even though we're far away. Uh, so what do you think is, is critical about this understanding of church as family? Why does this matter so much? Oh, I love this question because I love this topic so very, very much. I think one of the main reasons that this matters a great deal to me is that um, the Bible says that it's our new reality. And scripts are full of wonderful metaphors to describe our life. You know, we're the vine, we're the branches, we're spiritual stones in the temple of the Lord. Um, all, all sorts of things. We're parts of uh, a body. <laughs> we're fruit. We're um Think of all of those. But when the Bible talks about us being the children of God and of being adopted into God's family, that is not a metaphor. That is actually describing a spiritual truth, a fact that we have become the children of God. And then uh, correlated to that, if we have really and in actual truth been adopted as God's children, then that makes our relationship to one another to be that of siblings. We're adopted siblings into the same family. And that's not a metaphor. That's a description of a spiritual reality that's going to continue for eternity. And just like it takes us some time to like live into the reality of being the beloved children of God, like we know that, but we've got to kind of got to live into that truth devotionally, practically in our faith life. I think so too. Scripture again and again and again describes us as the Adelphoi of God, that's the Greek word, the brothers and sisters, the siblings of God. And that's not a metaphor, that's the truth. And um, more and more as I read the scripture, I think that is what God says we are. That's who we're going to be for ever and ever and ever. And part of our work here on church is to, to live into this, to learn how to love one another well um, as brothers and sisters, which is not just like a cute thing we say <laughs> to like fill in the blank. Hey, bro. Hey, sister. <laughs> it's actually describing something that um, scripture says is true. And when Jesus says that the world is supposed to know that we are Christians by our love, I think part of what he's talking about is that it's our family love that people are supposed to see, that there are a number of different types of bonds we're supposed to share with one another. Um, I'd love to talk to you more about those um, different kinds of bonds. But yeah, I care about it a great deal because it's the truth. And we've got to learn how to live into it. That is awesome. Um, one of the things that you said, Bronwyn, that I thought was so helpful was um, the reality that when we say we're brothers and sisters, right, um, that that's kind of a hard leap for folks to make because we've had, we have history with our family, with right. our actual <laughs> brothers and sisters that we don't have mm -hmm. with... Uh, sweet Sally, who's a member of our church community, but yet she's a sister, right? And so you said to look at it in a little bit different light that might help us. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that when you talked about like in-law. Sure. <laughs> yeah, it is a little bit of a strange thing to think about, oh, here's this room of strangers that I now apparently need to relate to as my brothers and sisters. Because when I sit down at the table with my adult sisters. I mean, we are not just arriving as strangers. We have, you know, at this point, 40 years of in-jokes and shared experiences that we're drawing from in our interaction. And it's really hard to make that leap. So I started to think, well, what would it look like for us to come to these relationships as adults with um, family who are strangers? And I thought, well, not many of us have been adopted into a family as an adult and had to start reckoning that. But one experience that I think many of us have had is that we have acquired close family as adults in um, our in-laws. So I don't have any natural born blood, blood brothers, but I do have brothers in law. And similarly, my husband has now my sisters as his sisters in law. And that has been actually a helpful paradigm for me thinking about what that looks like because we don't have the shared history. You know, for several of these, I don't even have a shared cultural background. Two of my brothers in law um, were, speak a different language. They're from a completely different ethnicity and culture. Um, but we're at around the family table together. We're sharing stories. Uh, we are planning holidays together. There is a presumed togetherness and intimacy in those adult relationships, but it's not at all sexual, right? That is my sister's spouse. <laughs> and um, my husband and my sister are close because they're like siblings at the table, but they're not, uh, nobody's flirting with anybody, right? There's all sorts of other family attachments that are going on there. And as I thought about relationships in the church, if I thought, if I think about this all as brothers and sisters in law, that helps me get the tone right. 
Yeah, that's just like those bonds that you're talking about that are so important. Mm -hmm. And, and there, there are so many different varieties of those bonds. Um, do you have a show right. and tell for us, Bronwyn, that could illustrate? <laughs> I do have a show and tell. <laughs> okay, so I'm the mom of three kids, and my youngest kid is a want-to-be inventor. You know, he's one of those kids that you can never take the recycling out. Like, taking the recycling out is like a stealth mission that has to happen in the middle of the night. Because if he sees you moving out with any boxes that he has not claimed, he's like, I have a use for that, right? <laughs> he repurposes everything. But as I look at some of my son's creations, I said, what are some of the things you can build out of? He's like, oh, oh, you can build with glue, with tape, with you know, sticky tech, with Elmer's glue, with a hot glue gun. You can weld. I'm like, please don't weld, boy. You are nine. He's like, you can use gravity. You can use string. Put all of these things together. So I have here a little example of the... <laughs> We were building with Ikea yesterday, and here's a construction, right, that he's made. So these are all folded together like a lattice work, right? We have uh, string tying things together. I have regular tape here. There's duct tape in the corners. This bottom part is held together with uh, toothpicks to make our basket. Um, it's a bit of a hodgepodge thing, but here's the point of this example, right? To hold any one of these mishmash of structures that shouldn't go together, together, we have a variety of different bonds of different strength and different types. You know, the tape, the glue, the sticky, whatever. And I was thinking about the fact that uh, kinship in Christ, community in Christ, has a variety of different bonds with which we attach to one another. Um, we've heard talk of the four loves. There's probably more, but just those four. You know, we know that eros is like the sexual bond and chemistry between two particular people, but we know that there's friendship love, a phileo love that comes with shared interests. And oh, I also love scrapbooking. I do not love scrapbooking. That's a hypothetical example. But I also love whatever, you know, the show. I love Ted Lasso. I love coffee. You know, those shared interests. We have a store gay love, like just this familial, I care for you because you're part of my my group, my, my clan, I have a strong protective feeling towards you. And then we have the agape love that we are called to in the family of God. And if you think of all of those as different types of bonds that are holding us together, you realize that you can put a really mishmash structure of very different materials together, very different people together. And it is not just one type of bond that holds us together. This is not just held together by tape. And our communities are not just held together by friendship or by loyalty within our communities. There's all of these um, different kind of things. And I, I think that's a really helpful metaphor for the church because we do live in a world that thinks of a continuum of relationships, that we go from being strangers to at some point we go to being friends, like we've added the friendship love part. And then for a few people, if you add the erotic connection, you know, that part happens. But the Bible says that there's many, many more types of attachment. We are all attached by agape love to guide into one another. We're attached by storge love, this familial connection where we're just part of the same community. You love one another because you're part of Woodland Hills Church, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you don't know somebody's name yet, you're attached to one another because you belong to Jesus. And then out of that kinship, we get the opportunity to add friendship. And with some people, your partner, your spouse, you will add um, erotic love. But any anyone bond is not holding the whole thing together we have a multiplicity of connections between us so here's my show and tell project <laughs> i love it uh bronwyn my greek is a little rusty what does storge mean uh exactly i don't know the exact translation english is such a an impoverished language with uh, that kind of thing but it's the it's the strong attachment love it has the idea of um a protective, effective bond. It's an uh, affectionate love towards one another. Mm -hmm. You're one of my people. You're my classmate. You're part of my community. You're my family. Mm -hmm. One of the things you mentioned when we were uh, talking with you was the importance of, you're talking about layers of bonds and different kinds of bonds. And you talked about um, weak bonds, those weaker bonds and yeah. how the <laughs> pandemic affected those. Yeah. Uh, that was really interesting. I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, I read an article about this pretty early on in the pandemic that talked about how um, one of the things that we were struggling with in our loneliness as we were sort of all thinking, why do I feel this way? Why am I experiencing this uh, grief, this estrangement, 
this just not feeling myself. And it's not just the, the horrors of distance learning, although that is the real pain, right? And they were saying that um, social, social scientists realize that we are people that are made with many, many different layers of attachment. So we have like our first circle of people that we are attached to, but then we have a next layer of, you know, friends and another layer of people that we see on the regular, like the neighbors that we see when we're pulling out the trash at the night or the fellow parents that you chat to on the side of the soccer game or the baseball game, um, or your regular, your regular barista or the person you see at the grocery store or the person you tend to chat to on your way in and out of work. And those levels of attachment as you grow out are actually all important for our sense of self and our sense of community. And one of the things that the pandemic did is that it shrank all of our circles really, really small, just to that first kind of primary layer. And it gave us insight, the pandemic did, into how many tiers of relationship we ordinarily have and we actually need for our emotional and spiritual well-being. It turns out we are people who need a great number of weak bonds in our lives to help support that little uh, locus of strong bonds right at the center of our lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a part of the pandemic, I think, that not a lot of people realize maybe, just like... The, the people that you happen to run into or engage with when you're out doing what you do out and about. Well, when you're not out and about, you're in your four walls, that was a little harder to do. And so I, I think it's important to recognize that we have all of those bonds in our life and they're all important. And so we really do want to hone in on the particular bond of the church family and uh, the friendships that happen within the church family and the biblical call to be that for one another. I know, Emily, for you, that was something, like you said, you're a huge champion of. And so I just wanted to know, Bronwyn, if you could, and Emily, you can tag in too, if you could talk a little bit more about that paradigm shift that is so important for us to begin to truly relate to one another within the church as family. Mm -hmm. Oh, goodness. I think this just became so emotionally real for me in a new way after the pandemic. That first service that we all gathered together outside again after months of being online, I just couldn't stop crying. Yeah. It was just so good to see people's faces again, even just their eyes. You know, everybody was masked. I thought, I've missed you. I've missed your face. It's just, it has filled up some well in my heart to see you in person. Um, so yes, absolutely. I think that the the practicality of us realizing that these were not just, you know, people out there that I like and that I have a, you know, we're not just all members of the same fan club. We're actually members of one another. We belong mm. to one another. We have more than shared interest. We actually have a shared life and a shared love and a shared calling and a shared purpose really became an embodied truth for me in a different way in the last year and a half. And practically, it makes such a big difference, right? I mean, at a spiritual level, this is a discipleship step. For us to learn to live as the family of God is not just that good for us emotionally and spiritually, although it is, um, or relationally, it's good for us spiritually. You know, uh, we are, the Bible is full of the language of the you plural, the all you all of scripture. You all together put on the, the armor of God. You all together need to, learn to live, to love, to serve, to forgive, to uh, speak words of truth and love and psalms and hymns and spiritual uh, songs. And so there's a whole bunch of growing we're called to do together that as we live into our identity as the, com the beloved community, the beloved children of God, we actually, there's a spiritual growth component to it and we're practicing, we're practicing for eternity, right? When we shuffle off this mortal coil, then the real family dinner begins, right? So we're rehearsing and there's a spiritual component to that. But at a practical level, just for you and I today, it's so helpful for us to think about what this means, um, not just as an, a mental truth, but as something we're living and expressing to overcome our fear, our fears of reaching out. You know, we always worry we're going to be a little bit creepy. You know, it's like calling someone out of the blue, out of like cold calling. And we're like, oh, that's very socially not done. You know, <laughs> I don't want to be a stalker or something strange where I'm afraid of initiating a relationship with this person or here's a new guy at church. I would like to welcome them. They look like they're new. But if I talk to him and say, hello, is he going to think that I'm like interested in him or asking him out? No, I'm a sister in Christ and I just don't know his name yet. Mm -hmm. And I want to be able to reach out and include people and welcome them 
give them a space, welcome them to be to sit down at the family table and get to know one another, even if they're not part of my small group, even if they're not in the life stage, same life stage as me, you know? I'm like the Christian norm, right? I'm a, a married woman with kids, right? <laughs> I've checked all the boxes. But there are all sorts of people walking inside of our, into our church doors who um, are wondering if there's a place for them. And mm-hmm. I get as a sister in Christ to say, pull up a table, you totally belong. Mm-hmm. I love that. To me, it's a vision of the table just being longer and having so much room for yes. anyone to come and sit. Because yeah. You're so right. People do come in and they wonder, like, am I going to belong here? And we just want to, we should be the place that says, absolutely, yes, pull up a seat. There is room Mm -hmm. at the table for you. And I think we have the perfect example. You said this in your book, that Jesus didn't shy away from these these really valuable, intimate relationships with people. And so we have him as an example to follow, to really begin to embrace one another as a family, because... (laughs) We're stuck with each other for forever, for all eternity. (laughs) Like, oh man, we don't get to. We get to. We get to. Yes, yes, yes. We get to be together for eternity. It's a glorious thing. We get to be with each other for all eternity. It's going to be rough with you, Shauna. I know, know. right? What are we going to do, Emily? (laughs) (laughs) No, it's going to be really bad with Greg. He's the one I'm not looking forward to. Uh, (laughs) I think hopefully there's like geographical locations that we can kind of (laughs) know. But this was really... In the Father's house, there are many rooms. Yeah, yeah. This was um, really heavy on your heart too, Emily. And you've really talked about, for your life, the importance of church family being there, truly a family for one another and for you. Do you want to add anything to the practicality that Bronwyn's talking about? Yeah, I think it uh, is really significant for me as a single woman. I think it's something that I've come to rely on and need. Um, I've really leaned hard into church's family Uh, because I don't actually think you can live single life well if you're just doing it on your own. And so the church is family, and real family, not just in name only, uh, like you said, hey, brother, hey, sister, but really um, like doing the things that family does, serving that role, has been so significant in me. But the thing I want people to understand is it's not just change your, doesn't just change your life if you're single. Yeah. <laughs> it changes your life if you're married. It's not just like, oh, we need those poor single people to yeah. feel like they belong. That's right. <laughs> Belly up to the bar. Right, we need exactly. You too. It's yeah. like the reason we get out extra leaves at the table and pull out the folding chairs is because we all need it. We're all changed by it and mm-hmm. all shaped by it. And so I, I want us to be able to, to grasp that. And I think that's something that the church can bring that, that society doesn't offer. I don't know if y'all have any thoughts on this, but what, if, if we didn't have the church as family, what categories would we be stuck with? Uh, what, what, what options do we have if we don't have the church as family? Oh. That was a curveball. We, that wasn't in our notes. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Well, Bronwyn's the expert, so I'll give her first crack at it. <laughs> She's like, thanks, Shauna. Expert. That's terrifying. <laughs> I, I would say that I have experience, not expertise, but just in trying to, to live that out. I think if we don't have the church's family, we feel a little stuck for a story to explain our lives. Um, I mean, we all have a narrative arc, right, that we're told. And we live in a world that tells stories all the time about how relationships and community happen. And the story of our love songs and the story of our TV shows and our, um, our movies or, you know, generally, boy meets girl, there's some kind of attraction, and at some point, usually at the end of the season, so that you'll carry on watching season two, somebody gets together you know, and seals the deal, and um, that's that's the story of how people get on, you know, get along in life, but the church has versions of the same thing, like we tell the story about how people meet as a couple, and then we tell a danger version of that story about how people who shouldn't be together are flirting really close to that and then explosive things happen and marriages fall apart and Bibles fall apart and churches fall apart. Um, But if those are the only stories we know to plot ourselves into, that's really um, dizzying uh, and scary. (laughs) And it's very, very lonely because those stories are insufficient Mm -hmm. to tell the story of my actual life and relationships. There are dozens of men in my life right now with whom I am not fulfilling the romance story or the danger story. I'm not remotely attracted to them. There's no, you know, chemistry going on. 
that I work with these people. I serve alongside these people. I love them. I welcome them into my home. There are all these women in our lives that my husband's in relationship with for which those sort of uh, everything is about sexual chemistry stories don't fit. And we need a different and better story. Mm. And if we don't have a story of family, if we don't have a narrative of what it means to be a safe and healthy and hospitable person as a friend, and not as just as a friend, as a woman friend. Like I'm not an androgynous person going out offering androgynous, friend, you know, androgynous relationships. But what it means to be an embodied woman, having relationships with other embodied men and women in the world that show respect and safety and courtesy, that extend the love of God, that extend the love of God's family. Um, we won't know what story we're a part of. Mm. Mm. I would imagine that if we don't see one another as family, and if we're not uh, cultivating friendship with one another, it would be a much easier path to other one another <laughs> and discount one another. And then we're not learning and growing from others who are unlike us. And so just to circle back to what is the other option if we didn't do that, I mean, that would be yeah. what I imagine. And I don't think that would be good at all. Othering. Yeah. And yeah. we wouldn't be in relationship with anybody who we didn't quite care for. Yeah. 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 You've been alluding to and kind of touching on this. I think this is a big thing that has come up in this series um, is how our sexuality fits into friendship. And the, your book is called Beyond Awkward Side Hugs, but the subtitle is Living as Brothers and Sisters in a Hypersexualized World. Did I get that right? Close? Sex Christ world, yes. Okay. <laughs> so our, our world has, has just, we're swimming in this emphasis on sex and it makes it difficult to have relationships both with whoever you're attracted to. If you're attracted across genders or if you're attracted within the same gender, everything is in this context of, of sexuality. So can you speak to maybe how the church has dropped the ball on that and how we can rethink these relationships and how family fits into that? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yes, I, I mean, I... I could write a book on this. <laughs> I care a great deal about this. Just topic. real quick, Bronwyn, solve all those issues for the world. Yeah, I think that there is a real fear that we have about the way that these relationships can go wrong. We are we have heard so many stories about um, things going wrong, people getting hurt. We've possibly experienced, you know, a broken marriage, a broken church. There is real pain that has happened because people have not stewarded their sexuality well. Um, who've been frivolous with their covenants. And I don't in any way, shape or form want to be um, undermining that. <laughs> that, is, that is real and heartbreaking. The Lord grieves it and we grieve it as our communities. However, we need something more than fear of things going wrong to govern our relationships. We need um, a, better, a better pattern. You know, fear of sin never managed to keep anybody from unrighteousness. We need love to motivate us to something better. We need righteousness as a goal. We need um, the family of God as a vision that we're moving towards. We want more for our marriages than just to avoid an affair, right? If our goal is just the fear of avoiding an affair, that'll, that'll get you so far maybe and you'll be able to avoid having an affair. But isn't our vision for marriage bigger than that? that we want love-filled, flourishing, prosperous, fruitful marriages, right? And we want more for our friendships and more for our churches than that, than just having avoided a scandal. We want places of life and vitality and of hospitality. And we do need to learn how to have um, healthy friendships with one another, how to, how to be married in community with one another, how to be friends not just to people, but to be friends to people's marriages. And there's such a subtle difference there, but it's really important. I don't just want people who support me. I want people who support my marriage to be around me as friends. So they're not going to like, if I'm having a frustrating day with my husband, just pile on and badmouth him. That's not being a good friend to my marriage. I want people around me that are going to be supportive of all the healthy bonds in my life. And I want to be that kind of person out. So I think that there's a mindset shift towards us being um, healthy individual bonds in a community of well-bonded people. I'll stop there and let you jump in before I get carried away. Now, along with that, though, I mean, there is a sense that there is some need for boundaries and, and caution. And <laughs> so God. there's nuance there. Uh, so right. <laughs> nuance, what a great concept. Uh, so 
what, what wisdom is there in protecting married relationships and holding that intention with uh, we're brothers and sisters-in-law? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, I want to pause there just for a second and say that there's some of the stories that we are reading about the Me Too Church Two movement, about big name celebrities falling apart and their marriage falling about. Um, are warnings not just about the danger of male-female relationships that can go wrong. Some of those are really cautionary tales about how power dynamics can go wrong. And those are not always the same thing, right? And so our caution is not just about how to steward our sexuality. A whole bunch of the examples that we're looking at also need us to question and check in on how we balance and steward vulnerable power dynamics in our relationships. So when someone is much older than you or much younger than you, when you're a counselor, when you're a minister, when you are the boss in a relationship, when you are a small group leader, there are unequal power dynamics where one person is generally more emotionally and uh, often spiritually vulnerable. The other person is not disclosing as much. Also, the person with more power is not held as, as accountable. I mean, when was the last time you went up to your power and said, how are you doing in your spiritual life and are you being accountable? There's this, this unequal dynamic and all of those can set the stage for some dangerous situations. So I just want to put that caveat out there that um, healthy boundaries don't just have to do with sexuality. Often they have to do with us um, figuring out what the, the power dynamics in our situation are. Having said that, let's assume that all of our power dynamics are the same, that we're talking about the relationship between the guy sitting on my left and the woman sitting on my right, just on the pews and we're all equal. One of them I've already mentioned, be a good friend to that person's family, whatever that stage may be, not just to them, to the exclusion of their family, but be a healthy influence. I think practices of confession and self-scrutiny are good in any part of our Christian life. We need people that we can tell the real truth to and who we have invited to tell the real truth back to us to hold up a mirror because we are masters of self-deception. And one of the signs of our growth is that we are willing to take a look at the hard, ugly truths of ourselves and at least have one person, if not a small group of people that you can check in with. And the more uh, power and influence you, you wield, the more important it is for us to have those kind of check-ins. Um, I think that we're always looking towards protecting our own marriages, not hiding things from your spouse, um, being willing to share, you know, cultivating and taking care of your own internal relationships so that there's health there. And then one of the, um, yeah, and these are questions of character ultimately, right? Not a question of having good rules or good software, <laughs> although software can help, right? But ultimately, you know, if you use the example of, um, of a dog, right? The safest dog in the neighborhood, and I write about this in the book, is not the one on the shortest leash. The safest dog in the neighborhood is the one that's the best trained, you know, that has the internal uh, training to know not to run and bolt out of things. It's not the question of the leash, it's the question of the training. And so it is with us. Rules have some value in restraining us, but we ultimately want to be internally self-disciplined, well-trained people, and so working at that. I'll say one more thing, and that was a very helpful thing I came across uh, from an author called Ty Griggs, and he, he talked about instead of governing your marriages and your relationships by legalism, um, he said, think about hospitality as being your governing principle here, because this is part of the nuance here. But hospitality is really concerned, not just about, is not concerned about meeting your own needs. Hospitality thinks about what would it take to make this an, a physical and emotionally safe place for other people to feel welcome. And that's a good hallmark, right? Like, so you wouldn't, I wouldn't, I might invite someone over to have coffee, that's hospitable, but I wouldn't invite them to have a conversation in my bedroom because that's obviously an intimate space for my spouse and I, and that would be crossing a line. So that's just a little litmus test on, is this invitation, is this text, is this meeting one of hospitality? Am I, am I making it safe for them and welcoming for them? Is it safe and welcoming for me as well? Um, that will often be a better litmus test situation to situation than am I breaking a rule and did I need a rule here? Mm. Thank you, Bronwyn. Mm. Um, these times always go really quickly. So we always feel like we're going to ask all these questions and have all this conversation. Then it's like, yeah, no, we're not because we have a time limit. And so um, I would love for everyone to hear from you just in closing, like not 
not everyone knows what to do next. Like we've been in this series, they know the importance and they've heard the importance of the way we show up for one another and the way we engage one another. Um, but what are just some practical, like let's just call them baby steps that anyone listening to you can take to begin moving in this direction? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think we, we know a lot of ways about how to make friends, right? We know how to do the, um, the filet. We have a shared interest. Let's move forward. Let's do something together. We know how to do that. Um, and everybody knows the dating story. And you can do that in a healthier and unhealthy way. But I would like to say that if we could practice uh, leaning in towards our love and care and attachment towards one another, our stoge and agape kind of love, like practicing those other bonds, um, we can, we have something to move forward with and to offer people. So I would want to put two things in your, your thing. One is to extend care to people. Um, we started doing this at our church during the pandemic where our senior pastor said to us, just phone people to check on how they're doing. And my first thought is, I am not phoning people out of the blue. That is weird and bizarre. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. But realizing that actually it's not just that I've never had a conversation with this person and it would be weird, but actually we're already connected, right? Let's just lean into the fact that we are already part of the same community and I can check in on someone, respond to their need, uh, call them up out of the blue and say, hey, we're part of the same church family and I was just wanting to check in on you and can I bring you a meal, right? Um, but even say the words, because we're part of the same community, I wanted to check in on you and I can extend care. I just, um, a couple of weeks ago, helped someone who's recently divorced. I've called her up and said, do you need help assembling furniture when you move into this new place? Because that's hard to do by yourself and I'm, I'm handy with a drill. And she was like, yes, I really wasn't sure how I was going to do that by myself. That's an opportunity to extend care. Do you not just think about um, how you might do that? And don't worry uh, about the fact that you, you didn't have that friendship before. Con consider that you really do already have a basis for extending that care in Christ. The second thing is to extend hospitality. And just to think about the plus one, the extra leaf that you can pull out of the dining room table, that our families are not supposed to be insular, you know, where we're all standing in a holy huddle, like making eye contact with our spouse forever. We are supposed to be side by side in our marriages, facing out towards the world in service, our, you know, serving God together. And that gives us the opportunity to welcome people in. Thanksgiving is coming up. The holidays are coming up. Consider who might be left out. Who needs a card? Who on Valentine's Day didn't get a card that you could send one? Who on Christmas Day is going to have no one buying them a present? The single mom in your community is probably buying presents for her kids, but who will send her something? There are all sorts of ways that we can extend hospitality and extend care on the basis of the fact that we are already the connected family of God. That would be such a beautiful way for us to show the world that we're Christians by the way we love one another well. Thank you so much. I love that because, first of all, there's so many things, but first of all, we're not starting from, like we're starting ahead because we already have the connection of being, of being family, right? We just have to lean into that. And the other beautiful picture that I love is not looking inward at one another, but let's, standing si let's stand side by side with our family to see our other family members and who can we extend that care and that welcome to. I just think that's such a beautiful picture. And I dare say quite biblical, <laughs> kind of the way Jesus would do it, you think? <laughs> I kind of feel like we have to address really quickly, I know that I said that was the last thing, but it brought up something else, so I apologize. But we do have people who I know have, uh, they hear family, they hear brothers and sisters, even brothers and sisters-in-law, and there are just, there's some triggers because of some dysfunctionality. So how can we still be family to one another, overcoming some of those things? Because it feels like we're saying, this is something that Jesus is calling us to be and do. And so we need to figure out how to be and do that for one another. Do you have just a closing, helpful, pastoral, loving thing that could help people who are struggling with some of the terminology of family? Uh, you want pastoral and helpful. I was going to go the princess bride and say this word doesn't mean what you think it means. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it's not as helpful in the energy. I think the helpful thing here is to realize I'm so glad you mentioned that because it really is a very, very painful thing. Some of us are carrying such very, very deep wounds at the hand of family. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be very, very traumatizing. 
I want to go gently and patiently with uh, friends like that and say, I am so sorry you've been hurt that way. And that is not the way that God intended it to be. And the way that Ephesians describes it is that the father, you know, every family on earth gets their name from him, right? So it's supposed to be his perfect model of fatherhood, his perfect family from which we derive our families. But often that's not the way we think about it. We have these damaged families and we're trying to sort of extrapolate up towards the father, but it's so broken and it's hard to see. I do think that there's a place for us to be very compassionate on that healing journey for us to find counseling. But I also just want to say a word of hope that there is a better way and a perfect father. And um, it's worth pushing through the, the damaged debris to find a father who loves you perfectly that way. Beautifully said. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. <laughs> Thank you for giving so us a, a new you. story to live into. Yeah, so great. And you guys, practically speaking, for those of you who are here, uh, but also joining us online, we do have the Spiritual Friendships class. Now, we cannot promise you that you will meet your BFFL, best friend for life, in this class. That's not what it's about. But what it is, is an opportunity to learn more about what it means to show up for one another in this way of, of supporting one another and growing together um, in spiritual friendship, which is what God is calling us to be and do with one another. And if you have people in your life and you think, man, we could do this together, I, I want to try to pursue a more intentional spiritual friendship, we will present tools and practices that you can use. If you don't have those people in your life already, it's possible that you could meet some people in the class because you're going to be engaging with one another as well. And if that is just something that you're not able to do because maybe the time doesn't work for you, then maybe take what Bronwyn said and take some of those initial baby steps and extend welcome to some folks and ask them to meet with you and maybe watch a sermon together. Like, most times, Greg says some really good things that we can learn from, right? And we can dialogue that stuff together. And it's just a baby step. So you can extend welcome to folks, have them meet with you, watch a sermon together, and then discuss it. So there are some ways in which you can really do this. We are not trying to make this this huge, unattainable thing. Like, there are some really practical ways that you can do this. So if you do want to do the class, remember, it starts tomorrow at 7 p.m. And you can still sign up online. Bronwyn, you were great. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And we want to remind you all that if you have prayer needs, we do not want you to leave carrying those things. So please come and meet our prayer partners up front or go into a prayer room online. Also, don't miss the MuseCast on Tuesday. We'll talk more about what we heard today. We'll dive a little deeper, continue the conversation. Gathering groups are available where you get to discuss the sermons that you hear every weekend with others. And if you plan to be here next week and you have kiddos that you're going to check into our children's ministry, please remember to save your spot. Thank you for being here, everyone. Thanks, Emily. Good job. Thanks, Shauna. Good job. Woo! Have a blessed week, guys. Thanks so much.